Um, so welcome everyone. Um, those, for those of you who don't know, I'm Heather Hendershot, Director of Graduate Studies and Comparative Media Studies at MIT. Um, so great to uh, host this talk today with uh, Jorge Caraballo, who is a journalist and a 2022 Harvard Neiman Fellow. Um, before that, he worked for four years as the growth editor at Radio Ambulante, the most popular documentary podcast in Spanish, and the only one in that language distributed by NPR. There, he led online and offline engagement initiatives to grow the community around the podcast. He holds a master's degree in media innovation from Northeastern University. He is a Fulbright scholar and a Google News Initiative fellow. And the title of his talk today is How to Use Audio Storytelling to Cultivate a Community and Keep It Engaged. So I will pass the floor over to Jorge now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather Andrew, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. I will share my screen. I have a presentation. So, I, oh, let me go back because I have to share sound. Too. Share sound. Let's do it. Okay. So, I, no need to go deeper on this. This is me. This is my my baby. I I I work uh, four years as the growth editor at Radio Ambulante, and yes, I was. My, my mission was bringing more people in, into the podcast, more listeners, growing the audience. That was like a main metric. But another metric of success was creating the environment so people would participate. People would um, use Radio Ambulante as a centerpiece for civic conversations uh, and making the most impact out of, it, of, of our journalism. So I was constantly using the stories, which were which are episodes of 30 minutes, 45 minutes every week to all over Latin America. So Rayo Ambulante, a little bit of context, is a podcast. It's like this American life in Spanish. That's how you can make an idea of, of what it is. And every week, every Tuesday, we like they, they presented an episode. And that episode, my my goal was to make it was to make it as impactful as possible, and impactful by our standards was making it create conversations all around the continent. So that was my job, and what I what I what I want to do in this in this presentation is to show you some examples of how we did that, like what what kind of engagement exercises we did and why. Just like a little bit making you see how we cooked the, the, the dish. And then some principles that I think can be replicated by anyone that is interested in using storytelling. And this could be, of course, documentary as we, we did, nonfiction, but also it could be fiction. And it doesn't matter necessarily that these are audio stories to me, what this, what I learned in Radio Ambulante is that just a good story can be used to bring the attention of the internet, of people on the internet, and make it a platform to connect people among each other and to create a, a common purpose to, to get to know ourselves and to get to know others. So that's that I'm going to go step by step through those through those principles, and then we can have a Q&A. So let's start with this. So what you saw there is a video, a raw video on edited 
of a Radio Ambulante Zoom party. When the pandemic started and the spirit of our community was in the lowest level, we were like, we need to do something to remind ourselves that we are not alone, that this is not a podcast that is talking to individuals necessarily, but that this podcast is a platform of a community that is distributed all over a continent. In Latin America, in Europe, in the United States, there are around 90,000 people listening to this podcast every week. Um, and we can do something to, to remind that if you listen to Radio Ambulante, you share some things, some features with other people who also listen to Radio Ambulante. And we can celebrate, even though this is a tough, tough moment in our life, we can celebrate that we are not alone. And let's just do a party via Zoom. Let's see what happens. And we did that. So what you saw was the first party, and we did four of them. And to each of them, more than a thousand people attended. And they were, as you see here, they were turning their cameras on. They were showing uh, their pets, their customs, their children. They were showing you their living room. They were showing you their life. And it's still, to me, impressive that people trust it so much, right? We are all aware of how the internet is a place in which you need privacy because you don't know what are the intentions of those who you are interacting with. with. But in this community, in Radio Ambulante's community, even though most of these people don't know each other at all, and they're in very different backgrounds and countries and cultures, they share something. They're listeners of Radio Ambulante. And because of that, they trust each other. But this is not something that happened out of the blue. This is not something that was like a random idea. This was a conclusion. This was the consequence. This was a consequence of an effort of cultivating a community around storytelling. So there are other examples of these kind of interactions between strangers that listen to Radio Volante. This is a picture of a listening club, and we will talk about later, like strangers in their cities getting into a place where they listen to an episode and then have conversations, civic conversation. Or this, these are, this is a picture of our team in 2018 when we did a, a live show in New York and Washington, DC. Or yes, other examples that we're going to, I, I am going to describe what, how we have done it. Because I think that it's, it's important that we remember that the internet is not only that corporative platform in which these big corporations are giving you uh, some leverage to communicate with others, but the internet is also a network in which you can create trust. And to do that, stories, I think, are one of the main, main things or one of the main channels to connect people in a way that they trust each other and create together. So I'm going to describe you how we did that, but I think that this can be translated to many different contexts, not only in podcasts, but in, in other ways, other creative ways, other creative languages. So I'm going to show you some examples of our engagement and you will be able to listen a little bit of, of, these, of the stories that I am willing to do. By the way, disclosure, when I came to, to as an Iman fellow, I stopped working at Radio Ambulante. Uh, so this is a sample of what we did in the four years that I was there. So the first one is it's uh, an exercise that we did when we published an episode called Album de Migrantes or Migrants Album. Uh, I'm gonna show you, you're gonna listen a short clip and then I will give you more context about the story. Esto de migrar, además de que estás lejos de tu familia, es como que no te terminas de ir de Venezuela. Cada vez que pasa algo en Venezuela, te afecta directamente acá. Nosotros ahorita estamos y no estamos. Estamos aquí, como nos podemos ir a otro país, como nos podemos ir a otro y a otro, porque simplemente nuestra vida cabe en una maleta. Nuestra vida es una maleta, se convirtió en eso. Y siendo casi como nos vinimos, nos podemos ir y nos tenemos que ir. Nos tenemos que ir. So migration is a big theme in Latin America, and 
in the recent years, in the last five years, Venezuelan migration to other countries in the region, it's a big story. So what you just listen is Ana Mer. Ana Mer is a Venezuelan woman who migrated to Peru. And it was very hard for her to adapt to this new country, not only because she faced xenophobia, but also because of what she just said. Like, everything changes so quickly and you're still so attached to your home country that you need to be living in that unstable situation of, should I have roots in the new country? Should I root myself here? Or should I be prepared to move to another place? What do I do? Like, where do I belong? And one of the main characteristics of Radio Ambulante, or one of the big groups in, inside the Radio Ambulante community is that of migrants. Many of Radio Ambulante listeners are people who have migrated from Latin American countries to the United States, to Europe, to other places uh, in which they find new opportunities. So we knew that many listeners of Radio Ambulante shared kind of a similar story or had had, had lived uh, an experience similar to that one of Anamir. So we tried to do something. We tried to tap into that collective knowledge and experience inside our community and ask them to give Anamir advice or give Anamir some words of recognition and awareness of what she was going through. So we tweeted this, like as Anamir, our like this the main character of today's episode, many of the people that listen to Raimulate know what it means to be a migrant. So share a story, a short story about your experience establishing yourself in a new place. What was the hardest thing or the most exciting thing? And we use it this hashtag. And this thing exploded. We started getting this kind of responses. More than 10 years ago, I haven't left in, I haven't lived in Argentina where I was born. I left, I lived in Puerto Rico and then I met friendship there and disgrace. Now we live in Bogota where the sun kisses me and I'm uh, drowned by books that don't let me go. And here I understood that to be a migrant can also be a nationality. And then people started sharing pictures. We didn't ask them to share pictures. They started sharing pictures of their first years of being migrants or this guy who had like 3,000 retweets, which was very unusual in our, in our engagement strategy or engagement work. Uh, he said, I got four years ago here in Paris with 200 euro, euros, no speaking French, not knowing anyone. I started working as a dishwasher. Uh, and a year ago, I brought my dad because my mother died. And today I'm the chef of a bar. I speak French and I live with my dad in an apartment and he was using the hashtag. And this was very intimate stories, right? Of people who were somehow reflect, who, who felt reflected in Anamir's story, but at the same time were proud of what came after that turbulent first time or first period as migrants. One up, and then people were like acknowledging that a podcast like she, Cello, she's saying when a podcast generates that listeners um, uh, make their universe bigger and multiply the stories. And this is what was going on. And this is what I think it's super, super valuable because Anna Mer's story became the first in a block of another stories. And what was happening here is that the listeners were making this story bigger. We're enlarging the story. We're making it more complex. And the paradigm, like the first, the, the way we understand, we usually understand our role as storytellers is that we produce the story, we publish the story, and that's it, right? People can comment the story, people can share the story, but what is happening here is that people are making the story grow with their own stories. The episode didn't end. The episode was not a discrete piece when we published it. The episode was open. And the continuation of the episode is this, is this. And I find striking and, 
and beautiful to understand storytelling as an open-ended process, collaborative and participative, right? So this is what was going on with this story. Uh, this person is saying, Guarra Ambulante, and the stories in this hashtag have me crying, celebrating, laughing, thinking about my people. So that's just an example of how the character of a story, and this is a nonfiction story, is not alone because you, as a listener, you are also a character of the podcast. And we we're, we're going to talk more about that meta thing later. This is another example. It's called Mi Lugar de Siempre, or my favorite place. And it was about a story. It was an exercise that we did or a ritual, as I will start calling it. it this was a ritual that we did when we published this story uh, about a group of friends in San Jose, Costa Rica, the capital of Costa Rica. This is a group of college friends who started gathering at this very tiny, uh, dark karaoke bar in downtown San Jose. This was a bar that almost only them attended. It was not the most popular bar. It was not, in, not at all in the list of touristic places in San Jose. It was like a kind of secret corner of the city that they colored with their identities, with their joyfulness, and they got to know the, the owner of the bar. And unfortunately, and this is a spoiler of the story, but unfortunately, the owner of the bar was this Chinese woman, mysterious Chinese woman, decided to close the place. And with that decision, their life as a group like took a different direction. So we decided to focus on something that it was like a, a, an important line in the story, which was these places that become content or become vessels of your identity and are not the most popular places in your city. But I think we all, we all have that. We all, even though, even if we live in a city or in, in, in a rural area, we all have these kind of sanctuaries that are relevant to, our, to the, expre the expression of our, of our identity, of our freedom. And we wanted to know what were those sanctuaries for our listeners? We have listeners, as I told you, everywhere in, in the world, mostly in the United States, uh, and South America and Central America, also in Europe. And we wanted to know what were those sanctuaries? And not only to know that, but to see them. And not only to see them, but to make them useful. So we asked people, what's your favorite city in the, what's your favorite place in the city you live? Not the most touristic one, but the one that you love most. Uh, mention it using mm, this hashtag, Mi Lugar de Siempre, and we're going to make a map of places that you cannot miss with your recommendations. And we did this. We, we, we got this. We, we got this kind of responses. Uh, so she's sharing a place in Mexico City, in the biggest university there, uh, or this one in Sierra Leona, in Freetown, or this one in... Montreal, this is like a kind of small cafe. We got this, we got a lot of things. And then we were like, okay, let's make something with this. And we created a collaborative map. And this is a very simple thing. We, we, we created a, a collaborative Google map. So anyone, instead of sending tweets with pictures, could just create a pin in their city and share it with others. And the idea of this was to create like a touristic guide of Latin American uh, secret places or more loved places by listeners. So as a Radio Ambulante listener, if you go to Argentina, you will have some options or some places that are relevant to listeners in Argentina. If you go to Peru, the same. If you go to Colombia, if you go to the US, then you will have some reference of what are those places that are important to other listeners of Radio Ambulante, and they are uh, organized by categories. So there were restaurants for jazz clubs, there were these bookstores, there were uh, also karaoke bars, a lot of stuff. And this is an idea that it's very like 
easy to replicate and you could spend a lot of time trying to develop a map or uh, like the, the lines of code to create this in a fancy way. But we were like, let's use the things that people use that are simple to replicate and to make this exercise because we have found that we cannot ask, like we need to ask for things that are not very time demanding if we want this to be really participative. And at the same time, it needs to be useful. The incentive for people to participate is that this will be useful for them and for others. If it's not like that, they don't, they don't, they don't engage. So engagement, like good practice is just use the platforms that people use and Google Docs is something that almost everyone uses. Other way of engaging with people and making stories uh, live beyond the limits of an audio story or of an episode is like these conversation prompts that we started using on social media. So this is a this is a, a question that we asked in like five months after the pandemic started. This is September 2020. Uh, after the worst of the quarantine, we asked people like, hey, for those of you who have little children at home, what was the most memorable game exercise or project that you, that you did with them during, work, during quarantine? So these were a lot of parents that had been stuck in their apartments or houses with children. And we wanted, to, we wanted them to single out that memorable moment the memorable thing that they did with their, with their children, because we had done an episode about that. We had done an episode in which the characters had done that. So a lot of comments about that, or this one was a, one year after the pandemic was declared, and we asked people, what's the best thing that happened to you in a year full of bad news? And at the same time, like 200 comments. So we were trying to make conversations that were improbable and that we're not just for the sake of having comments but of making people think about those not i wouldn't say positive things but things that are not usually in the mainstream narrative of this was a terrible year which was or this was i like i only i, I had no ideas of what to do with my children which is true uh, but at the same time, there were other stuff happening, right? And, and, and we wanted to focus on that and to use the experience of the community to have that conversation happen. We, have, we also did extra episodes with the community and because of the community, which is something that most newsrooms, uh, that, that newsrooms usually try to avoid because when you open the doors of your editorial newsroom to your audience, then they will start demanding, or that's the that's the the fear of editors and journalists is that they will start demanding you to do what they want and interfering with your creative or editorial independence. But we were like, let's just not play that game anymore. Let's just actually listen. Like people are listening to us. Let's listen. Let's listen back. Is the is the minimum we can do like one of the rules of the internet is reciprocity if this is a network it needs to be reciprocal so we asked people what kind of stories they wanted to 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 listen to and they voted a like there was a big pool of suggestions and pitches that people sent and they voted for the stories that other listeners sent that and then we prioritize and then we would pick the, the winners so uh, this is one of them, like this is an episode that we did for a story about a uh, trans little girl in Argentina, the first girl that was declared a uh, trans in, in, in the country. Uh, and we did a story, like that was the that was story, the story of this girl who didn't identify with her, with the sex that she was born when, when that she was born. So we did a story of, okay, this is a story of a five-year-old girl and it's very emotional and we 
get to listen to the mother and to a country that is debating if should be rec like legally recognized or not. But the story ends with the girl, which she's just seven years old. And we wanted to know what was the experience of those listeners in Rayambulante who identify themselves as trans and are not kids anymore. What's this, what's their story? We want to see what's, what will be the life of this girl in 10, 15 years? And to answer that question, we asked listeners in Rayambulante that identify as trans and we did an extra episode. Or we did this one, and this one was suggested by the, 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 the community. Like, we want to know what's the story in Medellin, which is my city, the city where I was born. What's the story in Medellin with narco tours? Because there is something happening in this city, and this is like a listener sent this idea. There are people coming from all over the world to Medellin to visit the places where Pablo Escobar lived or the places where, where he where he had where he put bombs. And I wonder why are they doing that? And what, what what and what's the city? How is the city dealing with that troubled past? So because I was there as a as a reporter, I did the story, Pablo Escobar, and I did one of these tours that took me to her cemetery, to the to his tomb. Uh, that took me to the place where he was in jail, to his building, like a building that he built, that where he lived. And, and then I was able to talk to one of the guides of those tours to ask them, why are you doing this? Like, why are you glorifying this person who victimized so many people? And it's a, it's a very, I think, powerful story to touch the identity of a city. And we did it thanks to to listeners who suggested it and to other listeners who voted for it. Or we did this one in which we tell the story of Rayo Ambulante. So this is a meta story. Like this is the story of a podcast who makes stories, that makes stories, which is also, which became the most listened episode in Rayo Ambulante. We also have fun interactions in social media. And like, like for example, a question, those who listen to podcasts when they were in public transportation or in their cars during the pandemic, when are you listening to podcasts right now? And there are like 660 responses. Like this is a, like podcasts are a medium that somehow demands routines. Like you listen to your podcast usually when you're doing something that you constantly do, going out for a walk, uh, going to commuting, uh, washing your dishes, whatever. So now that the routines are so messed up because of the pandemic, like when are you listening to them? Or another question is, how would you explain what a podcast is to your grandfather, to your grandmother, without mentioning the words radio and internet? Because we're all the time constantly exploring, how do people think about this medium? How do they, how do they relate with this medium? Which is essential if we want to be useful and, and deliver our message, we need to understand what does this mean to them? So this kind of question we did then, or another one to grow and to expand the network. We ask people like mention a friend uh, that doesn't listen to podcasts and tell us a, pod a detail about that person, her favorite movie, her zodiacal sign, a secret, whatever you want to tell us. And then we will respond, we will reply with the ideal episode for them of Ryan Bulante. So they start listening to our podcast. So we, we were using data from the listeners. And at the same time, we were referring. We will, we will try to hook those referrals with a personalized recommendation. But our strategy, engagement strategy, was not limited only to the stories. We wanted also to create uh, an environment, different new environments to listen to podcasts. So the first one and the one that I think I, I'm very proud of is listening clubs. We we got this tweet in 2017, November 2017. I arrived in Triangulante in August 2017, so a little less than two months before, before like two months before this podcast, before this tweet, 
And this is Diane Velez, a listener. I didn't know her. She says, Radio Ambulante is more than a podcast in our home. It's family. It's what Velex Mixtape and I discuss on Wednesdays. It's what my parents listen to while venga y ayuda a cortar papa, uh, which means come and help us to cut the potatoes. And she has in parentheses, check out ta tablet next to cutting board. So there they start cutting potatoes together uh, and they're listening to an episode. And we were like, oh my God, people are, people are listening to this together. This is not like one of the assumptions that we had four or five years ago is that podcasts are a very intimate, individualistic medium. Like you listen to your podcast in your headphones and that's something that it's speaking to your ear and to your ear only. And they started challenging that, that assumption. And we, got, we started getting more and more of these messages. Like then we were seeing uh, uh, some colleagues at work in lunchtime listening to an episode and we were like, okay, this is something that is happening. That's interesting. And then we were like, oh my, we need to tap into this opportunity because maybe podcasts are not necessarily something that you should listen to alone. So we created listening clubs and I want you to watch this three minute video. Los clubes de escucha son eventos en los que los oyentes de un podcast, en este caso Radio Ambulante, se encuentran en persona a escuchar una historia y después a tener una conversación alrededor de ella. Hemos hecho 20 clubes en 9 ciudades y hemos visto cómo personas desconocidas terminan abriéndose, confiando y expresando puntos de vista diversos que enriquecen no solo la comprensión de las historias, sino también de su propio contexto. El concepto es que cada quien desarrolla aquello que ejercita, ¿cierto? Y lo que queremos nosotros ejercitar es el oído, ¿sí? el acto de escuchar a otro y de encontrarse con otro a través de la conversación. Además es emocionante ver cómo los conflictos de las historias resuenan de manera única en cada comunidad y cómo en grupo es mucho más fácil proponer soluciones. Pero eso se acabó el día que la empresa simplemente desapareció de un día para otro sin avisarle a nadie, ni siquiera a los clientes, menos a los actores. La parte más importante de los clubes de escucha, el corazón de los clubes, es la conversación que se tiene después de escuchar la historia. Ahora en Radio Ambulante queremos que cualquier persona pueda replicar este modelo, que encuentre su comunidad y que aproveche las historias para tener conversaciones significativas sobre lo que le gusta, sobre su realidad, sobre sus identidades. Para eso liberamos todos los recursos, la metodología, la identidad gráfica, todo. Es un modelo abierto y gratuito para que cualquiera lo adapte y disfrute con otros. Escuchar podcast es una de las cosas más personales que hay, pero también puede ser una actividad colectiva que fortalece nuestras comunidades y que nos ayuda a conocernos mejor. La escucha activa es una habilidad que hay que ejercitar y nos parece que no hay mejor manera que hacerlo juntos. So what, what happened when we opened this, this is the video that we published at the beginning. We had tested the idea, we did it in, our, in the cities where Radio Ambulante team members were, and we moderated those conversations and we like kind of calibrated the model. And then we opened it up and we asked listeners, you do it. Like this, now this is for you. We will, not, we will not be organizing listening clubs. It's not part of our 
we don't have the capacity to do this. Like we did this for you to do it. So if you want to use it, here's everything. And we published and we gave them everything as, as, as I said in the video. And it was incredible. And there have been more than 2,250 listening clubs organized by listeners in more than 50 cities around the world. This is a decentralized model. This is a model that each of those listening clubs have been, have been organized. All the resources come from listeners. And it's something that people feel responsible for, accountable to each other. And a lot of friendships and, and things have started because of this. So more than 3,000 people across the world have gathered to listen episodes together. This is the... This is one of the screenshots, a screenshot of a map of 75 listening clubs that happen on a day when we watch our ninth season. Like listeners all over the world organized listening clubs to listen to the first episode of that season. The incentive was, we're going to give you the episode, we're going to send you the episode before it's published to the world. If you connect with others in your community and listen to this together. Uh, we created a website and you can still access it, listeningclubs.com, uh, in which you can connect with other listeners, which was the hardest thing because yes, yes, I, I am in, Cam in Cambridge right now and I want to listen to an episode with other people, but how do I know where are they? So listeners were able in this website to put the event like and say, hey, I want to host this. And other listeners could see, oh, there is someone in Cambridge who wants to do this and they could sign up. Uh, so it was easier to connect. And we started getting this kind of picture. So this is a, this is a listening club in Panama, strangers who connected through Ramulante and became friends. This is the same in Mexico City. Uh, some people started like expressing their FOMO and this is like someone like, hey, does someone adopt me in a club? I'm from Puerto Rico and I can join online when the pandemic started. Uh, this is a, 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 hit, a hybrid because when the pandemic started, some clubs kept going to cafes if it was safe to do it, but other people join online. And this is a picture of the New York Listening Club, which has met nonstop, or at least until 2021, met, met nonstop uh, since 2019, uh, every week while we were in season. We also uh, have done live shows in which listeners go to, uh, to these places in which we tell live stories. And it is a way of connecting us directly with the audience and to remember that what connects us as a community is storytelling and listening and what, way, what best way to do it than telling the stories live. So we did, we have done tours uh, of, of that. And also another innovation or, or, or engagement strategy were these Zoom parties in which we invited people to celebrate in a, in a hard moment in our lives and to remind ourselves that this is a community. This, this is not a, a, a group of individuals, a network of individuals, but a community. So we hired DJs best DJs uh, of Latin American music. And this is what happened. Like people had fun, people once again expressed that, or yes, indicated that Prime Mulante is not an organization for them. It's not an institution that's that there's a distance between them and Rayo Blante, but that they are Rayo Blante. And this is a proof of that. So this is just like some gifts of, of how these parties went, which is super fun. Uh, and it's so diverse. I remember in like, I remember in the first listening club that I organized, I almost cried of the emotion. I, yes, like, because it was incredible to see people together, strangers together being so vulnerable. And I remember when I did this first party, it was like, oh my God, I just can't believe how much trust these people have on us uh, and how privileged we are to have connected this community. So a lot of tweets of celebration of the listeners 
Dream Clubs. Uh, they say in Rio Grande is the biggest family and joyful family in Latin America. Or the host, Rayon, uh, Daniel says, as usual, the Rayon, the Rayon Blante party on Zoom is life affirming. Yes, a lot of, of, of tweets just celebrating and somehow affirming our culture and the things that make us together. The last thing that I want to show as innovation is Lupa. We know that 20 per, around 20% 20 of Rayon Blante listeners are non-Spanish speakers who are learning Spanish. Uh, so we partner with a technology company and we created this, Lupa. Lupa is an app that uses Rayo Blanco stories to learn Spanish. So Spanish learners can at the same time discover Latin America through documentaries, audio documentaries, and learn Spanish at the same time. So all of those things that I have just mentioned to you led to something that it's not the goal like we, we 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 didn't do it because of that but at the same time it's it's a it's a natural consequence and it's also necessary for these efforts to keep going and that is the ambulantes the ambulantes is the membership program of Rai ambulante so listeners can become members and can start donating in a regular basis to Raimulante. And in exchange, they get some perks. So they get the episodes before they're published, they get some stickers, they get some stuff. Uh, but basically, it's not about what they get back, but they contribute to the community. So we started inviting people, we created like this campaign to make people join Raimulantes. Uh, and before we created this in 2019, this was the budget of Reambulante. So 60% of the budget came out of foundations, grants, 36% uh, out of NPR, which distributes the podcast. Uh, it has a, a, an exclusive distribution agreement and it gives some money in exchange of that agreement and 4% of donations of listeners. Uh, one year after that, year and a half after that, this is how it changed it. So members were giving 20% of the budget, a fifth. That's a huge thing. Like that's a huge revenue stream for an organization, a nonprofit organization, because it means that those who the organization are serving are feel responsible for the success of the organization. They are members, they are, they're, they're invested in, in the success of Ryan Bulat. So storytelling at the end can lead like good storytelling and like honest, authentic engagement can lead to you being able to keep doing what you love to do or to keep working on your mission uh, in which like that, that is what's happening to Ryan Black. So that's what I wanted to show you of concrete examples. Now I will just go through 10 basic steps to build an engaged community. Like what did I learn? What did we learn as an engagement team uh, after doing those things that you just saw, right? So let me just take 30 seconds of silence because I know I've been talking a lot. So let's just 30 seconds of <laughs> just letting it in and I'll start, okay? Before thinking about doing an engagement strategy for anything you do, like if you have a podcast, you have a newsletter, you have a storytelling project, a hybrid storytelling project, you have a game, whatever you have. If you want to open it up and you want to invite people to participate, you need to ask yourself these questions first. First is why do you want to do it? What's the motivation? What are you expecting out of it? Do you want to do 
engagement because you want them to become members at the end or because you want to expand the stories with the knowledge that it's in the community because you want to have to trigger conversations that are not happening you need to understand what what is your motivation and also if you have the capacity to maintain it over time because what happens what usually happens is that companies start companies or organizations start investing in engagement and they start doing these kind of prompts online and uh, asking people to participate but then they're overwhelmed or they're busy with other stuff and then and they don't have resources or attention to their engagement efforts and people feel that they're used that they're exploited that their attention is just a resource that the organization or the individuals are uh, mistreating so do you have the capacity to maintain it over time to keep listening to keep being to keep devoting attention to those who are speaking to you how will you measure success is another important uh, question. And it's related to the first one, like will you, rate, will you measure success because you have more comments in your social media, more likes, more shares, more listeners, or you will measure success because the conversations are super meaningful or because you've got to uh, mobilize 10 people, 10 strangers to gather in a cafe and get to know each other. Like how will you measure success? That's important and it varies a lot. It depends on, on, on what's your focus. Are you willing to listen actively? Which is, which is like <laughs> the, the question, right? Because as I said, you know, like we know, each of us know when we are being listened to and I, as an engagement editor, I'm on social media uh, as a human being, like I go to social media and it's very easy for me to see when a company or even a person, an influencer, whatever, is asking questions just because they want to show or perform that they're popular and that they're relevant in their communities, not because they really care about what they're asking. Or, and you know that because of, the, the way they engage with those who respond, right? And also the last one is, what communities are meaningful to you? And this is a question that I ask myself all the time as, as, a, as a citizen, as, as, as me, like what are those communities that are meaningful to me and why? Like, why is it so important to me to participate in this, uh, conversation around x or y like why 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 do i feel so invested in this or that community why i'm so why am i so like why do i feel so engaged in conversations around this or that topic because those communities that are meaningful to you will give you will be your referent to the communities that you want to create right that you want to that you want to connect at the end you don't create a community but you connect it. So the first principle is define your mission. It's like, that's for like state one. It's like, how, what's your value? And how do you articulate that value in a narrative that connects with people? And I, I usually think about missions as, as, as a narrative. Like it, there is an art, there must be a conflict, right? What's the main problem that you're tackling? And, after asking that, why you should, why are you invested there? Why are you interested in that? Why, what, what, why are you prepared to live in this, in this scenario, in this environment? And what's your plan? What makes your approach effective and unique? And who are your allies? So in Ryan Valente's mission, for example, is to bring greater understanding about Latin America using audio storytelling. That's it, right? And that's, that bring greater understanding about Latin America and Latin, in Latinos in the US. It's something that it's easy to connect with because Latinos, we have, Latinas, we have been so affected by stereotypes in outside Latin America and even inside Latin America that to bring greater understanding means that we're challenging this, those stereotypes. And the way to challenge those stereotypes is telling stories that show complex characters that live ordinary lives, but they're complex, right? So that 
complexity, which is in every story of Lion Lente, is kind of a symbol of what many Latinos and Latinas feel that we just need to, we want to be, to be seen as three-dimensional human beings, and that's not usually happening in, in some environments. So when you see someone who has a mission and has the skills and the, a good plan, like Radio Ambulante does, it's easier for, for listeners to connect to that and to see Radio Ambulante more, not only like a, one more podcast in your list, but someone who's helping you to advance that goal that it's the goal of that organization too. Embrace a network mindset. We are online all the time, right? We're, we're digital beings now. So what are the communities that are already engaged in conversations around the issues you cover? You need to, you need to diagnose who are those people who are already interested in those issues and how those, the network structure looks like. How are they connected? Uh, how many people, how, how they behave? Uh, like how the information flows in those in those networks. And then you need to engage with those networks. It's not about, this is me, I hold all the truth, I know everything, listen to me, but be humble and say, hey, let's just let's just collaborate. Like what are you doing? This is what I'm planning to do. How can we uh, work together and adapt? Like, and this is mostly in the journalism landscape, but like Journalism is no a finished product. It's not like a, it's not something that it's already done when you publish it, but it's it's a process. And I think that to understand yourself as part of a process and not as a product, a, yeah, not as a production company, it helps a lot to engage with people. So this is the mindset of the of the productivity factory and in which things are just unidirectional and in networks it's like something that it's going on and it's flowing in many directions and it's connecting you with many many more it's not one to many but many to many uh, go to know get to know those who share your purpose so now that you have diagnosed where those who are already interested in what you're doing like get to know them like who are they who are your listeners listen to them what are their questions? What are their needs? Maybe a lot of you here know about design thinking or human-centered design. And it's just that. It's like, who is the person who's listening to you? Why do they find you valuable? What are the stuff they need? And maybe can you serve them? So this is why we ended up doing Lupa, for example, that app, that app for Spanish learners. We knew that they were listening to Rayambulante because they wanted to learn Spanish. So we made it easier uh, and at the same time, we made it profitable. Collaborate, let them know to welcome their helping hands. Like that's why we ask people, you have great ideas. We, we, we cannot come up with new ideas every week alone. So let us know what kind of stories would you like us to tell? And like just inviting them and knowing and making, making them know that you're open to that makes a huge difference. And finally, get data. Use surveys. We did a, a, a survey every year. Uh, we called people. We did in-person meetings with people. To understand? Yes. Like, how can we serve you, serve you better? Share your expertise. And this is what I was saying about being reciprocal online. Like, give, give, give. Like, this is. To me, the spirit of the internet is share, 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 because, and this is super hippie, I'm sorry, but the, I think when you share in a network, it comes back somehow, right? If you're actually part of a network. So like for three years, we were giving, giving, giving to the community. We were not asking for money, only in specific occasions, like giving Tuesday, like specific days, but we were mostly giving. And when we felt ready to, install the membership program immediately it started coming in and i am aware i'm aware that it's very hard to give three years uh, if you're not getting back if you don't have all the revenue streams we had the privilege of having the grants and, and mpr but you get the concept like it's you're in a network you have give 
and you receive. You give and you receive. Respect people's attention because there's a lot of noise out there. And I think this is, a, a, you know, this is a huge problem of the internet right now. We're saturated, saturated with information. Our attention span is limited. So let's do things that stand out and that are valuable to people and that feel useful and meaningful and not let's just not to make more noise and recognize your blind spots like your blind spot because many times uh, we are so narrow-minded with the way we see the world that we forget that there are many things that we just don't know or that we don't do right and we should be humble and ask like hey how can i get better so this is ways in which we share our expertise. We did a lot of workshops uh, in, like in which we taught others how to do a good interview for radio, or in which we, uh, in, in our website, we created Escuela Rayamblante, which is free resources for those who want to produce stories, or we created a newsletter in which we, re we were recommending every week things that were inspiring us online. So other podcasts, music, videos, stories. So we were all the time just sharing, 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 sharing. This one to me is super important and it's related to the first part of, the, of this talk in which you should develop rituals and routines. Because it, I think networks, and this is a, 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 a quote from Guido Caldarelli, networks try to explain how a set of isolated elements are transformed through a pattern of interactions into groups and communities. And what are those interactions? What's the pattern of interactions that you can facilitate so a group is created, right? You have a network, maybe some people are interested in what you're interested, but that doesn't mean that there is a group. And the community is formed when those interactions become regular, become constant, and they, 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 they have a pattern, right? So gather meaningfully, uh, be constant, and make it unpredictable. And sometimes we, we feel that, yes, to talk to people or to get together, let's do a, ask me anything, or just let's do a Twitter space, and then you just get stuck in those kind of uh, platforms. And there's much, there are many more ways to get together. And if you're not creative, people will just start seeing it as noise and repetitive. So you need to create refreshing ways of gathering meaningfully. There's a great book uh, that it's called The Art of Gathering that I recommend if you're planning to learn more about this. So this is an example. We publish a story about a girl who was kidna kidnapped uh, in Latin America. And then we just ask people, but. The story was about the family album of, of the family who were trying to find her in the, in the story. And then people started sending pictures of their own family albums, which was great. So it was a, a way to connect people around the issue of that episode. A, a listening club so is another way. This is a, a virtual listening club. Just like, just expand the repertoire of, of rituals that you do to connect people. Set rules to preserve trust, which is essential. If people don't trust those in the group, they won't participate. So you need to create a code of conduct and moderate it. We did that for the listening clubs. We did that for every space online that we had. Be a connector. It's not only that you connect with your listeners, but you connect listeners among each other and see your community as a team. So these are pictures of the listening clubs. These are like, these are not strangers to us. To, to us, these listeners are part of Radio Ambulante. And we, we see their collective expertise and knowledge as, as our knowledge. Choose the right platform. And this is key. Try to own your channels because if you devote all your engagement work to Instagram, to Twitter, to Facebook, once they change the rules, then you're screwed. So you need to own your channels. So have a mailing list, for example, or a list of phone numbers that helps a lot. Make it horizontal. Like how can you connect with people, not in a hierarchical way, but more like in the same level. And 
explore it. Sometimes it's great to do it online, but sometimes it's great just to do it offline. In Radio Volante's case, we had our own channel. So this is the podcast feed. We publish our episodes and people, like this is something that we own. It's an RSS that we own or a WhatsApp. In WhatsApp, we had a huge list of like 3,000, almost 4,000 listeners. And when WhatsApp didn't allow us to create like broadcast lists, we took all those numbers and those numbers, phone numbers are ours. It's not, they're not of WhatsApp. So that gave us a, a, an ability to react against that change of rules, but we still use the app in ways we, like in last year, we still were using the app in which, in ways that were useful. And this is a newsletter, which is an also a, a, a list that you use. It's a, it's a media that you use, that you own, sorry. And finally, make it look unique, like the visuals and the style, they say a lot about who you are, even before people start reading you or listening to you. So these are illustrations for different episodes of Triangulante that are made by artists in, in, this, in the region. And these are origin, original artwork that stands out in social media. We had a design team, a, yes, that made it look unique. And that is super important if you really want to stand out. And finally, enjoy, because I think that social, like the engagement thing, it's about getting together in creative ways. And joy is a big part of it. If it's boring, unfortunately, there are many boring instances in people's lives. So you just have to make it fun. And some useful frameworks. This is a this is a the membership guide of a, the membership puzzle project, which was a project a, of New York University, and they studied how people become become members, like how. Uh, an individual that is just becoming aware of a, of a brand then becomes a really huge engaged ambassador of the brand. So that, that is a useful framework that you could study. This is a book called Get Together, which is also like a, a guidebook to understand different communities and how can you create or replicate that, that things that they, that they found out there. And also this one, it's super, I, to me, it was very uh, orienting. It's called the community canvas, which uh, divides the community building process into three sections uh, that are divided in themes that are very, very useful too. So that's it uh, from me. Uh, thank you so much for listening, and I would be happy to to answer questions and uh, yeah, and just to talk. Thank you. Okay. I will stop sharing. Thank you, um, Jorge. Um, we're all muted, so I think other people are applauding, but maybe can only hear me. Um, so yeah, let's open up to uh, questions. We have uh, 20 minutes or so for discussion. Who would like to kick us off? Um, I think Tomas had his hand up there first. Great. Uh, thank you for a fantastic talk. And I was especially interested in the fact that you mentioned uh, your revenue strategies and how you monetized uh, and how you made the project sustainable, which I think is super interesting. And I was wondering, and I understand this is kind of the most pressing problem for independent media. And I was wondering if you could share some advice you would give to, to other uh, similar projects uh, who are interested in monetizing their platform, their, their medium and make, them, make it sustainable. Yes, yes, I think that, it, it, it at the like the bottom line to me but you know like to to someone with a hammer everything is a nail and to me that i'm thinking about communities to me the bottom line is to have a community that actually it's actually invested in what you do so for example i am part of uh, a community in colombia that is led by this woman who's publishing content about how can we be more friendly and loving with the earth Right? How can we be more conscious of what we're doing to the earth? And she has been publishing in a blog for like 10 years. And like two years ago, she was like, hey, if I, if I, if I, I want to keep doing this, but I cannot do it without your support. So she created this Patreon and hundreds, maybe thousands of people are part of that community. 
and allow her to do that. But they, they, are, they are so engaged because she has been constant. She has been generous. She's clever. She's insightful. She's what she publishes useful. It has changed our lives. It makes us feel part of, uh, of something that is larger than ourselves. It's, it, it connects, like she is a referent of the change that we want to make. And when you become that, when you're in the, if you're in independent media, if your mission is very clear and what you're doing, it's really useful and you are effective inviting people to follow your work, to make it better. If you're listening to them and asking them, hey, what do you need and how can I help you? When you get to that point in which the community is large enough and uh, it's event it, 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 it will eventually happen, then you can say, okay, like this is what we have. We're here together. We're part of this. You are connected to each other because we are doing this work. But if we want to keep doing this together, we need we need your support and your financial support. And it's completely okay to say that openly and people respond in ways that surprise you, like positive ways that surprise you. So my advice is, is that is like, give, be useful, listen back, uh, serve to the, the needs of the people and make your purpose super clear so people feel that you are advancing a mission that is your mission and it's their mission too. Heather, is it right if I do a small follow-up question? Yeah. All right. So thank you. Thank you for that, Jorge. That seems truly interesting. And it's true that once a community gets a certain size, then it is a, there you can find a slice that is willing to fund you, right? But I wonder if 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 how do you like if you've been giving your community free content for a while, why would they expect to to pay you? Which is what I see a lot of content creators gra gra grapple with, right? Like mm -hmm. how do you communicate to them that your work needs to be funded in a in a situation where so much content is available for free, right? So I recommend you to check and study if this is something that you are you're trying to do. Go and read the membership guide, uh, and it's part of the membership puzzle project. It was their final project, so the membership puzzle project is still there, but uh, in a in a new way. But there is something called the membership guide that they produced last year. And they dissected a lot of organizations that have been in that exact situation. Like how, we, how do we do, how, how we create membership? Like how can we make people support us? And they have a lot of cases which are super, super interesting. But I just want to highlight something that they say. And one of the reasons why people become members is not because of the content, but because of the community. Because if you, if you connect a community and like then people will feel that if you're not there, the community will not be there and they don't want that loss. They don't want to lose that community because the community is what is giving a lot of value to their lives. So somehow if creating the community is at the same time creating the base for your sustainability because the community is what people value and they will pay to be part of that community. Great, thank you. Um, so yes, and that's the membership. Yes, that's the membership guide, Andrew, that you put in the chat. Thank you. Oh, good. Yeah, I saw that question. Thank you, Andrew. Um, next, we have Amber. Thank you, Heather. Uh, thank you, Jorge, for this amazing talk. I was especially interested in when you were talking about like making the story grow and storytelling as an open-ended process, but I and I was wondering how did you choose which specific like episodes or themes to use for your community engagement in social media? Because I'm assuming that not all episodes were, you know, like you continue yes. <laughs> using it. So yeah. Yes, definitely. There are some episodes, like political episodes, that are just like no. <laughs> There is not, there is not no human 
it's harder to identify with. So the episodes that, that we use for this kind of exercises were those episodes in which you as, in which the universal experience of the character was easier to see and was, uh, and was easy to identify. So migration, for example, or uh, your connection to a city, um, your, your relationship with, your, with, a, with an object, like a precious object in your family, things that you're like, oh yes, I get this, I get this, I get this, I have that. Like, the, like I can translate that into my life super easily. But those episodes that were more focused on hyper-specific things of, of the reality of in Latin America, uh, they were harder to, to translate into this kind of engagement. But yes, like it's human experience and universal, like universal, universal experience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could, you, you talked about so many successful engagement strategies. Um, well, first I want to say I'm super impressed by your optimism about the internet. And there's a moment where you actually said the internet is for listening. And I was like, that's great because of course we've all had sort of the opposite experience and especially yes. with, with Twitter, right? And, and things can, can go awry. Um, and, um, you know, I was wondering if you could talk about some of your engagement strategies that maybe failed or were less strong and, you know, what you learned from that uh, for, for going forward. Oh, yes, many of them, many, 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 many. Like many of engagement prompts had zero responses, five responses. Uh, and I think that one thing that we learned after many failures is that you cannot ask people to think a lot, like to reflect a lot before starting typing and starting thinking about their interaction or their intervention. So many questions felt like paper questions and people won't like stop their social media feed to write down homework. They just don't want that. They just want to have fun or they just want to uh, go to a place in their mind, which is not the place in their mind that they have to go to write down a thesis, right? So it needs to be closer to their heart. It needs to be a, it needs to be in that sweet spot of emotionally, emotions and argument. A, and that is very hard to craft into a prompt. So many of the prompts were felt like very mental, very rational. And people just ignored that completely. So in many of the stories, in some of the stories, we ask people to give opinions that they were not interested in thinking about the complexity of the situation in their own lives. And because, start very, because the prompt is difficult, very few responses happen. And because very few responses happen, less people see it. And at the end, it's just buried in, in the feed. So that's something, right, that we learned about, about how to craft prompts uh, and how can, be, how can you be creative and meaningful at the same time? At the beginning of the pandemic, we did an exercise that, were, that was relatively frivolous, superf like it was, yes, it was stupid. It, it could be seen as stupid, but it worked. Uh, and it was like, we started asking people when we were locked down all around the world, we wanted to understand how were they perceiving the world. So we focus on a sense every week, a different sense every week. So we started asking people, show us what you're seeing, uh, send us a picture of what you're seeing in the first window at your right hand, and then hundreds of things. Then uh, send us, uh, I don't remember which sense, like all of the senses, but every sense had a different prompt and it worked. And what, it, what, what happened, what, what we were trying to do is to understand the community as a body, 
as a single body with thousands of eyes. Each listener was an eye. Each listener was a like a nose, a, a flavor. What 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 did you what was the last thing that you read in this pandemic or before the pandemic? Sorry, something like that. So we were thinking about the community as a as a huge system, as a huge body, and. I say this, this was a, a successful case, but I say this because what you want is to go to the senses, go to the sensual before of, uh, before of the mind. Of course, some topics are good to think about and to like be rational and to have some conversations. It's very hard to have that. Uh, but when you go to, to what you're feeling and when you touch that in people, people immediately start participating. So the sweet spot between the sensual and the rational, it's something that we learned after many failures. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? I mean, I have one more. Oh, Andrew, yes. Yeah, thank you so much, Jorge. This has been wonderful. Um, I, you really got me thinking about uh, reminding me of an experience that I had um, when you talked about the listening groups. Um, so you, this was several years ago, I taught a podcast in class. And one of the things I was worried about was the selections that I had for, for listenings were students going to engage with them. So during MIT's January sort of period where you can teach whatever class that you want, I invited people to come listen to the things I was going to use in the semester long class. And that was the first time I'd been in a room with people sitting around a table and a speaker in the center, um, all listening to the same thing at the same time. Um, and I realized that, gosh, like 99% of the time that we're consuming media, whether it's in a movie theater, at a concert hall, uh, televisions in our own house, everything, we're, we're sitting staring at the same thing in the same direction, um, as opposed to those rooms where you're listening to something and you're sitting around, you're watching each other react to the same things and sort of getting a read of each other's faces. I guess my question was, you guys also did that over Zoom, is that right? Yes. Can you, yes. Did, did people have the same experience doing those groups over Zoom, like mediated through a computer screen as they did when they were listening in person together? I think I think yes, but it's harder. And of course, there are many things that you cannot read in a like in a in a screen because when you're when you're in a room in a round table, as you say, watching each other, you can feel the energy of the room. You can you can feel the attention of the room. You can feel the tension. You can feel the what's flowing, right? It, you become like a single entity. And, and when someone is anxious, when someone is uh, feeling nervous because he's speaking up about something that it's hard to process, there are many things that you, you read in the body. Uh, in Zoom, it's easier, I think, just to be a little bit distant, but overall, the quality of the conversation, I think, was was very good in Zoom too. It was less emotional. It was less emotional, but it was good. Like it was, it was insightful. It was diverse. Uh, it gave new ideas. Like one of the things that sometimes we we did listening clubs for stories before publishing them to see if there were things that were not clear that were mm -hmm. not that were that could be improved. And that was great in person or in Zoom. Like that worked either way. But I think that when you get in a room with strangers, when it's like in Zoom, the listening clubs were 100, 300 people. Instead, in, in, a, in, a, in a room, we were 12 people, 15 people. So there is kind of like, there is more vulnerability there, right? There's more, uh, it's more fragile. And, and that's something that you cannot replicate digitally. Thanks. I think we will. Um, we've got one last question I want to take from the attendees who aren't in the uh, uh, the panelist side of it. 
Um, this is from um, Aguinaldo Mello, who asked, how do you see podcasts serving as a medium to enable storytelling? And how do you think we can promote a similar kind of storytelling on, on other mediums? This is a question of the medium or the message. That's the question. <laughs> I think that podcasts, has, have, they, they have its own thing. Uh, it's very, like, we can go here into what makes podcasts different from radio. I think that it's mostly the same, but there's a huge difference, which is that you know who's listening to you. And because you know who's listening to you, there is, there is, there's a reciprocal relationship and there, there is a connection that you cannot have on radio. Of course, on radio, there were, you, you, you knew that were, there were like groups of people listening to you. You, you could know who are your uh, average listener, or they could send you things, letters, whatever. But in, in podcasts, there's this, because we're, it's a digital medium, you have data on who's listening to you, where, uh, when the attention is dropping, you know, you, you, you have many data points that inform you about who's on the other side. And at the same time, like they can just write you, they can they leave you reviews, they send you emails. Uh, so that ability to know who's on the other side gives you, if you're, if you're paying attention or shapes, if you're paying attention, the way you talk to that person, right? So I think that podcast, good podcast, feel so close to you because they know who you are, because they are seeing you, right? Almost in real time, not in real time, but they, 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 it's, data is so fresh that they know who's there and they know how to talk to you. And you feel that the podcasts you love are talking to you, not to people similar to you, but to you. And, and I cannot emphasize that enough. So I think that this is about the medium, of course, that enables the storytelling feel so close. Uh, but I think that, I think it's possible to replicate that or that that could be translated to other medium, digital mediums, right? But I, 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 uh, I don't know if that's the case in the other mediums. So if as a journalist that has experimented in magazines, in uh, video documentaries and radio and podcast I like the one in which I see higher engagement much higher engagement is in podcasts that is really interesting I'm really glad that um, we got into some issues about medium specificity at the end there that's great I think that Wade Roush who's in our um, attendee pool might uh, summarize things the best for us to close out he said um Fantastic session, so inspirational for those of us working to build community and podcasting. Congrats, Jorge, and enjoy the rest of your year at Harvard. So I would echo that. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And I'm just going to say one more thing, just put in a little plug for next week's uh, colloquium series. We have Hillary Shoot speaking uh, from Northeastern, and she's going to be talking about mouse. And um, I'll just add that, you know, we arranged this um, maybe almost two months ago. Um, she said her project was about the, you know, continuing relevance of mouse. And she was sort of asking like, do you still feel like it's relevant? And I was like, oh, absolutely. And of course this was before the recent uh, crisis and, and controversy around mouse in, in Tennessee. So it's gonna, it's gonna be a terrific, terrific talk. So um, I will see all the grad students there and I hope to see many of our other attendees there as well. Um, thank you again, Jorge and um, good night to everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye-bye.